Hello, I'm Amir Garakani. I'm the Director of Education at Silver Hill Hospital, and I'm very excited to be um, introducing uh, our speaker today. But first, I want to just give you some information about the program. Uh, first off, if you want to ask a question during our speech today, uh, you can go to the uh, Q&A section, which is uh, two speech bubbles with a question mark, and you click on that and you could write a question, and Dr. Ivanov, our speaker, will be able to answer them uh, during the time frame of the event. Finally, at the end of the talk, if you could please uh, look in the Q&A section under Publish, where you'll find a link for the attendance sign out and evaluation survey in order to get credit. Uh, uh, to start, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Henri Kisilenko, who will be introducing our speaker today. Dr. Kisilenko. Hello, welcome. Um, thanks for joining uh, Silver Hill Hospital Virtual Grand Rounds. Uh, uh, and it's my pleasure to uh, present uh, to you uh, my friend, Dr. Ilian Ivanov uh, and uh, his lecture, Not So Minimal Brain Disorder, Clinical Presentation and Treatment of Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder Across the Lifespan. Uh, Dr. Ivanov is an Associate Professor of Psychiatry at the Icahn School of Medicine in New York and a Medical Director of two clinical programs at Mount Sinai St. Luke's Hospital. Uh, in uh, his current position, Dr. Ivanov uh, uh, helps youths with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, childhood trauma, mood and anxiety disorders, uh, and substance abuse. Uh, he's the author of over 50 peer-reviewed publications uh, featured in the American Journal of Psychiatry, in JAMA Psychiatry, the Journal of New uh, Neuropsychopharmacology, he has contributed over 10 chapters to different textbooks on psychiatric and uh, addictive disorders, including uh, the Kaplan and Sadok uh, textbook, uh, the Dokan textbook of child adolescent psychiatry. Um, he's a member and a distinguished fellow of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and has served as a past president and an active board member of the New York uh, Council on Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Um, he's uh, a member of the uh, Adolescent Substance Abuse Committee of the um, uh, Academy, American Academy of Child Psychiatry. Uh, he has also received um, multiple uh, awards and honors, um, and I simply will uh, replace his lecture if I have to run <laughs> to, to say all, all of them. Uh, I also want to share something else about him. Uh, the fact that we are friends uh, gives me a, another uh, perspective on him other than uh, a scientist and a doctor. Um, uh, Dr. Ivanov is a very talented artist. Um, if, you, you, if you like jazz in New York, you may have run into him performing as a musician with uh, his group in some of the New York City joints. Uh, he, um, he does very good jazz standards and original music. And uh, he also has uh, had his uh, paintings and graphics exhibited in uh, some of the uh, uh, locations in New, York, in New York City. So in many ways, uh, he's a, a true Renaissance man. Uh, again, it's my pleasure now to introduce him and to, to give the word to Dr. Um, Ilian Ivanov. Thank you, Andre. Um... Thank you everyone for uh, tuning in. That was uh, a necessary generous presentation, but also all true. Um, in any event, I, you know, I was informed that there was over 100 people um, coming to uh, hear my presentation, which is much more than we ever had in any of the jazz concerts. So that is exciting and um, a little intimidating. In any event, uh, let me start with uh, just kind of maybe giving you a little bit of perspective as to why I'll be telling you about adult ADHD since I'm a child and adolescent psychiatry. I've been at Sinai since 2003 as um, faculty, and all the time uh, I have worked with adults as part of the uh, faculty practice that we have here. We have run a number of clinical trials with adults. Uh, some of them are still going on. Uh, I have also worked with the VA, which is our sister VA hospital, the Bronx VA, affiliated with Mount Sinai, and there was a program there for young veterans, like in their early 20s. Um, and we did some work with the ADHD in the military and the overlap between 
um, traumatic brain injury, especially the one that's related to not direct impact on the on the brain, but like blast exposure and associated uh, attentional problems. And I have also either attended and presented at a number of uh, ADHD organizations and meetings. There is a thing that's called APSART, which is the American Professional Society for ADHD and Related Disorders. There is an European organization called UNITITIS, and there's the World Federation. And for the last 10 years, uh, I have heard excellent presentations and have presented some of our work. So I can give you some perspective on um, you know, dealing with children, but how ADHD changes over the lifetime. And in terms of the title, just to quickly mention, uh, not so minimal brain disorder refers to the label of minimal brain disorder that was attached to ADHD in the 50s and the 60s, referring to the fact that there were no major like macroanatomical differences between individuals with ADHD and those who don't have it. However, with time we have found out that um, by the presentation of the phenotype, the behaviors, and learning more about the brain, there are some uh, very notable differences. I would not talk much about neurobiology and maybe just mention one of the studies that we did, but if there is any interest, I'll be happy to kind of uh, address any questions with that. Uh, let me move this along. And uh, these are my conflicts, but in respect to this presentation, <clears throat> there's uh, nothing that is related to the work that I'm going to be talking about. So let's start with um, these are the 18 symptoms that DSM-5, <coughs> sorry, the DSM-5 lists. And um, as you can see, especially here on the right side, hyperactivity and impulsivity, some of the descriptors are very clearly related to childhood behaviors. Uh, often these are reported by parents or teachers that quickly identify the behaviors. However, if you start asking adolescents and adults, you may get a completely different picture. And I remember the time when I was in training when um, the assumption was that ADHD is something that has early onset in childhood, even before preschool, but by the time of early adulthood, majority of people outgrow it. I remember a paper that we were reviewing in maybe late 90s suggesting that well, it's possible that 25% of the individuals have some residual symptoms. And that was kind of the understanding at the time. Um, the second part of the slide here talks to some of the long-term outcomes. Pictures speaks more than words, I guess. Uh, there's no suggestion that ADHD turns into a Trump. It's more related to the you being fired from the popular show. So individuals with ADHD have uh, somewhat less success in job uh, retention or changing jobs too quickly, substance use issues, major depression, suicidality, um, impulsive sexual behaviors, teenage pregnancy. I also want to tell you a little bit about uh, pregnancies in ADHD with the most recent findings and uh, academic uh, underachievement and legal problems. In terms of the prevalence, um, oh, before go before we go into that, uh, let me just mention quickly with the DSM-5 that came in 2013. There is an acknowledgement that this is a disorder that goes uh, beyond childhood, and the presentations are different, and the symptoms kind of migrate, but they don't disappear. So certain changes that came in DSM-5 related to the fact that um, for adults, for instance, over 17 years of age. Uh, the criteria to meet the number of symptoms to meet the criteria is reduced to five. These are the ones that I showed you on the right side that seem to be kind of more um, tailored towards uh, younger individuals. So now if you have five of these symptoms in six months or more, you would meet the criteria. So that's an adjustment because what happens if somebody reports five of those symptoms and not the sixth one, it's not like they don't have the impairment but they may just technically not meet the criteria for the diagnosis. The other kind of notable change is now the age of onset has been moved from six to 12, and that raises the question, which might be controversial for many, about the adult onset of ADHD. Now impairment, 
uh, and that's important, should be present in two or more settings. Uh, if the partner reports about uh, their partner and their ADHD symptoms, and these problems occur only in the context of their interaction, that may not be ADHD, that's probably something else. I'm going to tell you a little bit more of all the challenges of uh, you know, collecting adequate clinical data to make the diagnosis in adults. Um, and now to move to the prevalence. Uh, this is on the high end in children. Uh, numbers have been different, as low as 3%, as high as 18 in selected samples. Uh, 8 to 11 percent seems to be kind of the most frequently reported numbers. Some people would say it's more like 5 to 7. 75 percent of the children would exhibit and retain symptoms as adolescents. And in adults, uh, there is consistent findings that if you apply DSM type of criteria worldwide, you would get in the, uh, prevalence in the range of 4 percent and only 11% of adults seem to be receiving treatment. This is not just medication, any kind of treatment. I mentioned that symptoms change, kind of migrate over time, and uh, let me kind of review this in a little bit more detail. So inattentional problems seem to be the most persistent, and they're kind of uh, present uh, robustly in all age groups. However, they change. So this is the DSM-5 symptom domains, and the common adult manifestation may not be necessarily difficult to sustain your attention, doesn't listen, doesn't follow through, uh, but time management. And that's a very prominent feature of people who usually are late, usually late on coming to meetings, usually late on presenting their work, uh, deadlines with projects and things like it. Um, initiating tasks or doing uh, tasks that are due to a certain time in the 11th hour is a common presentation. Uh, often that results in maybe completing the task but doing some optimal work. Multitasking and procrastination. Many people would tell you that they wait. College students, for instance, often say, often say, I just wait the day before the project's due and then we scramble the very last minute and, you know, it is what it is. Um, there is also adaptive behaviors now with the availability of electronics. Uh, people use all kinds of reminders. People who may have supporting staff can benefit from that. There's also self-selected lifestyles. Uh, just a quick anecdote, but I remember a young man who came to us and he was working as a manager on a, a movie production uh, set. They were shooting like commercials and things like it. And when he was there by his report, uh, he managed a number of people. He had two cell phones, three pagers. It's if you kind of imagine it was like he was working in the emergency room. If you think of the medical setting, high intensity, quick changing demands for his job. And he claimed that he was doing pretty well. He hasn't been fired, so he was successful there. But he was running into trouble paying his bills even at the danger of being evicted. And he was saying, this is the most boring thing you can do on the weekend, sit down. This all in the times when you write checks and send bills. And he was not doing it. He has piles of things that uh, were overdue and uh, couldn't complete that task. Uh, in terms of the hyperactivity symptoms, these are the ones that uh, adults usually would not relate to and just may report they don't have it. In adulthood, hyperactivity seems to manifest mainly as a feeling of like tension, um, some necessity to move around, easily getting bored. And it could be adaptive. Sometimes people work long hours, do many things, multitask, or choose jobs that you know involve a lot of change in the location, moving to different places or changing of the uh, task at hand. And impulsivity is th that's an interesting cluster of symptoms that in adults presents mainly as uh, this emotional outbursts, low frustration tolerance, impulsively quitting uh, your job uh, or breaking up with a partner, um, losing temper, driving. Just, I, I, I had families when the spouse says like, he or she would, would kill us when something happens and the driving dramatically changes and driving 
um, for ADHD individuals has been identified more and more as like an area of uh, significant problems. Um, hasty decisions and impulsive aggression for the majority of cases, if this, if the disorder is like around ADHD and not comorbid conduct problems, it usually is limited to verbal aggression, more kind of the outbursts and the insults and the arguing can uh, rarely manifest its physical aggression. Uh, these are kind of usual presentations of ADHD in the workplace, and I kind of covered some of it, but incompleting projects, poor discipline, that's usually in around timing, being late, not on time, uh, submitting work late. Uh, poor performance, we hear this across the age groups. Often people would come and say, I know I can do better. I know I can do more. Uh, students, I could be being a, a B student and I can barely make C's now. Um, Frequent job changes, kind of jumping from position to position, quickly getting dissatisfied, quickly getting bored at uh, your job, and lack of career goals, which usually requires setting up a long-term goal and working diligently. <clears throat> Individuals with ADHD may have um, significant trouble with doing that. So the long-term consequences are related to the presence of those symptoms, but they are manifested somewhat differently in adults. Uh, so for children, it's usually around the poor academic performance. For the majority of cases, as I mentioned, it's underachieving. It's a smart kid, but you know, their grades are low because they don't submit. They forget the homework. They did it, left at home. Uh, they did everything at the last minute. It's not up to par. And uh, it's often that uh, they either <clears throat> fail their grades, drop out from school, uh, or get suspended. Um, in terms of the adults, things that researchers have looked into is related to increased number of uh, STDs, uh, three times more likely to be currently unemployed, uh, more likely to be divorced, being involved in some legal issues. Tobacco is an interesting component because it's one of the substances that comes very consistently within the ADHD research. I wouldn't talk more about this now, but if people have questions, maybe later on. But things like nicotine use in pregnant women and the association of ADHD in the children, um, the effect of stimulant or non-stimulant treatment or treatment in general on uh, Nicotine use, so nicotine has come over and over again uh, in relation to ADHD. <clears throat> Let me quickly review a couple of studies. Uh, there are several cohorts in the country and around the world that have followed individuals with ADHD longitudinally. So this is a study from NYU. It's famous in the ADHD field as the Manusa Klein cohort, about 135 males with ADHD and uh, 136 con controls recruited at the age of eight. This is a follow up uh, at the year 33. It was uh, published in 2012. I think they're still following up those individuals. And as you can see, they looked into educational, occupational, economic, social, marital status, but also the persistence of some diagnosis like ADHD itself and the social personality disorder, substance use disorders. And what they found out is that the ADHD group, this gets over here, had significantly worse outcomes in the functional domains, more divorce, less income, less paying, uh, lower paying jobs, and significantly higher rates of diagnosis of persistent ADHD and of social personality disorder, 16%. That is rather high. Substance use disorders. One interesting finding is that there is no increased onset of new disorders after the age of 20. So it's not like they're going to develop schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, bipolar depression, one of these major psychiatric diagnoses. And I should say that it's very rare that individuals with ADHD would end up being hospitalized. Uh, adults never, probably children extremely rarely, and that's in relation to something else, not ADHD itself. And uh, very quickly, this is actually a cohort that was recruited at Sinai and followed at our group. Um, we're less successful in terms of numbers. The follow-up at 15 years was only 40 individuals, 
These are kids who are recruited at the age of 7 to 11. They are special subgroups. So these are ADHD kids who also had physical aggression. They've been suspended from school. They've been fighting in school. So they're kind of the high risk ADHD kids. And what we found out is at the age of early 20s, about 50% of them had antisocial personality disorder. Four are deaf. That, you know, there are different reasons for that, but uh, there was early mortality. Few people were in jail. And as you can see, the cards were stacked like the wrong way even from the very beginning. Uh, full scale IQ was lower significantly for the antisocial personality group. Lower socioeconomic um, status, that's more the family, not the child itself, but more prevalent ODD and conduct disorder. They had higher ADHD scores in adulthood, although not significant, but the persistence was higher. And as you can see, 11 of them met criteria for antisocial personality disorder in their late adolescence, ages about 17, 18, and 10 more by the age of early 20. So this all raises the question, if this clinical presentations are there early on, and there is no added other risk factors, major psychiatric disorder later on, what, actually, what actually the treatment can do? Can treatment change the trajectory? Because as you can imagine, antisocial personality disorder and all these other functional outcomes that I mentioned are quite a burden on the person's life. Now, evaluating ADHD in adults is rather challenging. Um, one has to focus on impairment instead of just counting the symptoms. Comorbidity is common in terms of anxiety and depressed symptoms, but not major depression, not, uh, you know, uh, unremitting depression. Longitudinal history is critical if you can elicit it reliably, but um, remember it comes from your childhood is problematic and difficult sometimes. Also identifying impairment in different domains and adults usually have the adult person uh, reporting to you. As I mentioned, there are some challenges when a spouse a partner reports on their partner. It's rare that you're going to call adult person's parents or their boss on that account. So um, these are additional difficulties of collecting relevant clinical data. Retrospective recall is problematic and there is no objective measure. Now, that being said, there's certainly a number of validated questionnaires that you can use. Uh, I wouldn't go into all details, but just highlight some of uh, these are questionnaires for adults and they have different features. So the brown is uh, something that focuses on more of the inattentive symptoms. So it's good for high function adults, inattentive subtype. Connors is the one that maybe uh, most of you are familiar with. Connors have developed scales that are developmentally adjusted for children, adolescents. So this is the adult rating scale. They are normed, they have a cutoff point, and that they usually map well into the DSM diagnosis. Um, this is more of retrospective uh, when the scale in retrospective symptom recall, kind of having better information about the chronology of the disease. The Barclay scale focuses on the current symptoms, the last six months, they are less interested in what is the history of your disorder, whereas Barclay's focus then actually on current impairment, and I'll talk a little bit more about it. And some of the scales like uh, Len Adler scale here are mapped very closely to the DSM. Um, this scale in particular uh, actually have prompts. So it's taken from the DSM 5, 18 symptoms, but has prompts that are specific for adults. So when you administer the scale, you kind of adjust it and make adults understand better what they're reporting. How about objective measures? Now, CPT, which is a corner CPT, has been around for those of you. Um, just quick reminder, but the CPT is a computer scale. You do it on a computer like this. You press the space bar. Anytime you see a letter different than X, you press on A, on the B's, on the C's, on the Z's, T's, and whatever it might be. And ever so often the letter X comes on and you have to withhold your response. That's what's called continuous performance task. And it has different variations. It's constantly being improved, uh, if you will, but it's not diagnostic. It's usually a part of a larger neuropsych assessment, and it can give you information of vigilance, sustained attention, uh, impulsivity, uh, impulsiveness, and things like it. 
one thing that's been studied and been shown to be specific for ADHD maybe is what's called reaction time variability, which means uh, it's about 15 minute task for different blocks and people tend to trade off. They, they have to have, they tend to have faster reaction time in the first block and then by block three all of a sudden it drops and then it comes back quickly more so than in controls. Uh, there is a variation of the CPT with a sense of head motion. It's the quotient kind of this is the picture of the device itself. It's a bulky device. It's like a desk. We actually had this one in the clinic. Again, it's not diagnostic and the utility of VEG remains questionable. So now why do we treat ADHD in adults? It's not for the purpose of just controlling the symptoms, it's mainly to minimize the impairment from the core symptoms. And the improvement of the symptoms actually have been linked to improvement of function. Uh, that's a big question. Can you alter the course of the disorder? And it's very hard to answer at that point because there are different there are discrepancies between um, medication or other treatment addressing measurable units of behavior like reaction time, accuracy, and things like it, and addressing symptom improvement. In different studies, these things, as they're supposed to go together, they actually don't, and that's problematic for the field. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the real life impact of ADHD in adulthood because I think that's uh, really important since we're really focusing, want to focus on the social, on the um, functional impairment in things like pregnancy, driving, substance use disorders, life expectancy, and suicidality. Until recently, there was very little known about um, the safety of ADHD medication in, during pregnancy and the effect of ADHD during pregnancy. Um, I have heard very good arguments saying, you know, pregnancy by itself being defined by some as like, you know, the, the normative disease state. Um, the effect of added stress of experiencing ADHD symptoms and being, you know, the situations of like having trouble with uh, time management and uh, other social functioning. The question is how much that stress from the mother translates to the to the baby, to the fetus, and that's a legitimate question, and it's not very well answered at that point. However, many women uh, would not take medication during pregnancy for many different reasons, but in general, the you know prescribing medication during pregnancy is done with caution, as it is, and when there is no data, it's very much likely that individuals would not take medication. So there is um, uh, this review in 2014 still holds uh, very good points by Marlene Freeman, ADHD and pregnancy making this point that many women can stop ADHD medication uh, being concerned about side effects uh, and effects on the fetus, but for others the functional impairment may be severe with potentially severe consequences. And the fine print here says there are cases in which the benefits of stimulant treatment outweigh known and putative risks of immuterine medication exposure. They, um, Dr. Freeman also made an uh, important point about the driving uh, habits or the driving behaviors for pregnant women as that seemed to be uh, affecting both the mother and the child. And so recently, within the last couple of years, new data has emerged from this big data consortia and big data uh, repositories looking into the teratogenic and other effects of treatment, stimulant treatment in particular, during pregnancy. So this is a report from 2018. As you can see, over a million, close to 2 million pregnancy. It's replicated in uh, data from the Nordic countries, Northern Europe, in about 2.5 million pregnancies. And the highlight here is metophenidate, but not amphetamine. So one of the stimulant classes was associated with a small increase in the risk of cardiac malformation. And this is a study by um, David Cohen at Harvard. He actually presented at the AppSart in January. Um, it was an excellent presentation on ADHD and pregnancy and medication use. And if you uh, can find any of his presentations on the web or any of the papers, it's absolutely worth listening to. Uh, 
they've done uh, assessments uh, in respect to the amphetamine, metaphenidate, and atom oxygen treatment in early pregnancy and the association with preeclampsia and eclampsia. And there was a very small increased risk. And the summary is that due to the small increase in risk uh, in women with significant ADHD, uh, these patients should not be counseled on discontinuing their medication during pregnancy. So there is data now from um, huge data sets suggesting that yes, there is some risk. The risk is very small and probably uh, the benefit outweighs the I mentioned uh, ADHD and driving, and uh, this point has been kind of more and more emphasized in the last, maybe the last decade. Some people feel that individuals with ADHD have a responsibility, or at least should be mindful when they engage in driving rather than just reparking their car to be on their medication. <clears throat> so Russ Barkley has spoken about, uh, you know, many of us take driving is like, uh, almost like a habit, you know, you put it on autopilot and you go where you need to go and, and while you have other things going on and you're thinking about something else. Uh, however, the, the whole behavior around driving is rather complex and he breaks it down to some operational competencies, simple as like your reaction time and ability to orient and kind of shift attention is needed. Uh, then tactical competency, kind of how you move when the traffic gets more challenging and when there is more cars on the road, how you navigate safely through that. And then the strategic, like how well do you plan so you can go somewhere on time or not be too late instead of getting frustrated. And of course, with frustration comes impulsive behaviors. So the point here is that individuals with ADHD tend to show tendency to be more frequently involved in motor vehicle accidents. Some of them would, you know, fatal outcomes, not for them only, but for others. And it's almost like an ethical question that's been raised as to do they have the responsibility to take their medication when they driving. Now, uh, Russ Barkley has pushed the issue of like impact of ADHD on the well-being of the individual even further. So more recently, he has looked into the life expectancy, the estimated life expectancy in individuals with ADHD and have identified areas of um, you know negative outcomes like accidental injuries, adverse driving outcomes, as I mentioned, increased suicide risk, likelihood to be involved in violent crime, not just the verbal, the reactive aggression. Somebody gets very upset and then get physical with others. Uh, intimate partner violence. Uh, interesting ADHD, and that's consistently be shown. Uh, is also associated with higher rates of seizure disorders, as well as obes uh, obesity, poor eating habits, uh, other medical conditions, and poor preventive health. So the highlight here is, and the conclusion from a couple of publications, one is on the web, the other one is in print, is the childhood ADHD predicts a significantly reduced by almost by a decade, estimated life expectancies in adulthood which is further, uh, it's not reduced, it's increased, sorry for that, by the persistence of ADHD. Well, it's the reduces the expectancy. So from 10 to almost 13 years, so it's over a decade of human life. That is not necessarily related to ADHD per se, but all this satellite impairments, if you will, or comorbidities or related conditions, that have this negative impact on life expectancy. I mean, this notion hasn't caught fire. It has its critics, even in the ADHD community, but I think in general, it just raises the question of awareness about life expectancy in individuals with psychiatric disorders. And we know that the course diagnosis that is uh, going in the same direction, which is reduced life expectancy. Uh, this is a brand new publication, just came out a couple of months. Uh, from a group, there's actually two groups. One is uh, D'Onofrio group, which is the senior order that's based in Indianapolis, Indiana University, and uh, the first order is from Hong Kong. So they've used uh, combined data sets, 
Some of them are from insurance company claims. Some of them are from governmental uh, registries. As you can see, the numbers are like staggering and they're high. Close to 4 million individuals, uh, half of them females. And the conclusion of that publication is the stimulants are significantly associated with significant reduction of risk for suicide. And the non stimulants did not increase the risk of suicide. As you remember, one of the non stimulants is an antidepressant, and antidepressants have been associated with some increased risk of suicide. And similar studies have come out to look into other functional outcomes, suggesting that consistent treatment is associated with reduction in criminality, injuries, accidents, academic failure, and things like it. So these are the more recent uh, publications with the last couple of years. The other concern in terms of functioning and uh, functional outcomes is the uh, possibility that stimulants could be misused, abused, diverted. Uh, I know that um, many clinicians feel uncomfortable uh, many patients are uncomfortable and this is a recent publication from 2019 in what's called the orange journal uh, this is the journal of the child and adolescent um, the uh, american academy of child and adolescent psychiatry and what you see here these are uh, these are terms that are used by different publications so there is a considerable amount of overlap this is non-medical use abuse misuse diversion they can mean similar things. It's not the discretion of the or the discretion of people who published the articles before that. That means somebody obtained the medication from a family member, from friends, colleagues, peers at school, peers at um, other locations. And as you can see, each dot represents individual present, uh, individual publication, and the range of uh, reports. Uh, were quite wide, as low as 2%, almost 60%, from 0.7 to 80. So there is enough information out there for us to be really concerned. One thing to keep in mind is that when some people consider ADHD by itself to be kind of a risk factor for the development of adolescent substance use, adolescents in general are a population group that have high rates of experimentation with drugs and uh, although there's a difference but for the most part this difference is not that large and not significant this is from our cohort looking into adhd and controls and the rates of drug use and alcohol and uh, this is more prominent here and again they're different but it's not like the non-adhd population doesn't experiment so the question of like, can treatment reduce substance use? So the development of substance use disorder is probably a subject for another presentation. Uh, we actually have done, in terms of research, uh, quite a bit of work into looking into, into that. There is a lot of data out there that has to be kind of carefully reviewed because they're conflicting, <clears throat> conflicting reports. And uh, one thing I would like to mention in terms of neurobiology, ADHD and substance use seem to share biological underpinnings that could be suggestive that if you expose a child early on to an abusable substance like amphetamines, you might be changing something in the brain. Now, many studies actually, longitudinal studies, have shown that by treating children with stimulants, we don't turn these children into substance abusing individuals. So that's reassuring. There are certainly studies that show that stimulant treatment can actually have a positive impact in the development of substance use disorders in adolescents. This is here on the left. Non-treated versus treated ADHD individuals and the prevalence of substance use disorder significantly lower. But again, when it comes to nicotine, uh, that doesn't, have, doesn't seem to have, treatment doesn't seem to have any significant impact. This is from the same group that I mentioned before, suicidality. First of all, it's uh, Patrick Quinn, the paper that came 2018 and generated a lot of attention in the Green Journal. And uh, again, it was almost 3 million individuals. And it concluded that um, 
when the individual, so these are claims from the insurance company, during the periods when the individuals, based on the insurance claim, fill their prescriptions for ADHD, they have less incidence of substance-related problems. So they couldn't measure substance use criteria or the amount of use. They look into things like going to the emergency room because you're injured when you're drunk or had an accident when you are under the influence. Something that was documented that the outcome, the clinical outcome was related to substance use. And they suggested that people who took medication more consistently over the period of time when they took the medication, this incidence uh, came down. Now, again, uh, all this is reassuring, still doesn't change the fact that a lot of people feel either uncomfortable or concerned. And um, what are the treatment options? How one should uh, kind of manage that? There, there are some kind of general guidelines. Long acting stimulants are pre preferable. Now, manufacturers have developed formulations that make it very difficult to extract the substance, the amphetamine and the metaphenidate. The capsules could be very hard, unbreakable almost. The patch, uh, you know, the medication is prepared in a certain way, so you cannot just open the capsule and take the stimulant from in there. There's also the lixdesamphetamine, which is a prodrug. Um, it's the nature of the chemistry that prevents from this initial impact of the stimulant. And of course, there are the non-stimulants that are also approved as a first-line treatment. And in terms of clinical practice, what are the strategies for managed ADHD meds that are, you know, control substances? You can use objective measures to document if there is a change, uh, not just the self-report, because people may come and report many things. Uh, and if you take it in phase value, sometimes, you know, that raises questions. Uh, certainly document that you have counseled the person about the potential for the substances to be uh, misused. Um, in terms of individuals who may have history or, you know, are involved, have kind of active substance use disorder, really treating both conditions is essential. I have done work with one of the community substance use clinics in the city. We had individuals with ADHD. We have developed protocols for prescribing stimulants for them when it's needed for certain function, for work, for school, and things like it. And we can still safely monitor their substance use disorders, but don't treat in isolation is the point. Uh, close follow-up, maybe not once a month, maybe once every two weeks, maybe every week, it depends. Um, you can do your toxins. Of course, we use iStop, and I think it's available in the tri-state area. So there, there are a number of uh, clinical approaches to be sure that what you're prescribing is not being uh, misused. I also should say that when prescribed in the recommended doses, stimulants are not widely uh, abused. And the patients usually don't report that they have this feeling of euphoria when they kind of, let's say, take cocaine. Uh, when it's successful, for most part, they come and tell, I don't feel anything. I just take the medication, but I know without it, my day is going to be miserable because my work schedule is such and such, and I'm not able to follow that, and I cannot do that. Um, people who have, you know, high responsibility jobs, doctors, lawyers, whatever it might be, People who sit for exams, I mean, they, they can tell you that uh, that makes a significant difference, but nobody reports, I feel high. One of the things that they often report is that they may feel like the withdrawal from the, from the drug, and we can talk a little bit more about that. What are the treatment guidelines? So they're more established. Uh, there are different uh, organizations. ACAP is the American Academy, uh, American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, CDC. And for children, they're kind of pretty clear. Uh, preschool children, you start with evidence-based behavioral therapy and um, modifications there. And you can add metaphenidate if symptoms don't improve or if the behavioral therapy is not available. For kids in school age, you can use both of the ADA approved stimulant medications, which is uh, amphetamines and metaphenidate as well as atomoxetin and the alpha agonists, in addition to behavioral therapy. And there is no guideline for adults, but they have been extrapolated mainly from the uh, guidelines. 
Now, environmental modifications for individuals in ADHD pay off. Uh, these are things like, again, many of us may take this for granted and like common sense. You'd be surprised how often patients don't think about those things. But, you know, kind of control the environment. There are many things that you can do. How are you going to do work? Um, you know, be in a room that is in general quiet, avoid distractors, have organizers, electronic reminders, establish centers when you always put your keys in that particular place. You always put the bills in that other place, or whatever it might be. People they usually often come and tell you they lose things left and right. Keys, passports, their wallets, whatever it is. Um, and one of the first studies actually has come from here, from Mount Sinai, Mary Salanto. There's this metacognitive training for adults with ADHD in group setting that broke down uh, the time management organization skill planning and training into didactic. So they have a couple of sessions when they educated people. Then they have in-session exercises and then people had home assignments and they came back and reported. So it was kind of a 12, um, 8 to 12, I think they, they varied uh, group sessions. And what they've shown here is in terms of the DSM inattention and hyperactivity scores, pre-test to post-test, there was a significant you know, reduction. And the change in the T-score was significant for the metacognitive therapy. This is the red line. Whereas support as usual pretty much didn't uh, yield any, uh, any changes. Now, I'll talk a little bit about, well, for the rest of the presentation, I'm going to talk about the medication. It won't be well good. And this is a busy slide that summarizes the two groups of stimulants, uh, short, intermediate, and long acting, the non stimulant medication and some investigational drugs. You would have the PDF, so let me not spend much time on that particular slide, other than to say there are four classes of medication that are considered first line treatment for ADHD. All of them have shown um, clinical efficacy. Uh, stimulants, everybody's familiar with those. There, there's, in terms of uh, mechanism of action, they have an effect on increasing the level of dopamine and norepinephrine in the synaptic cleft by either inhibiting the reuptake, which is by inhibiting the transporter that clears these chemicals, or inhibiting the receptor that takes the chemical back and also increasing the release uh, from the uh, vesicular. So it's the, the end result is uh, increased level of dopamine and norepinephrine in the synapse. And this is a older paper, but I think it still holds true in terms of the level of response to the two classes of medication, either individually to amphetamine and metaphenidate. Amphetamine has an edge here or equal response to both. So these individuals who preferentially respond to amphetamine, about 28%. 16 preferentially respond to NPH. It doesn't matter because they couldn't tolerate the other medication. 40% respond to both. Cumulatively, this is over 70% who have 80% response, which um, I'm not sure how many other medications in psychiatry or in medicine in general can show that. Um, so in terms of selecting stimulants in adolescents and adults versus in younger children, um, it's usually targeting, as I mentioned before, inattentive symptoms. These are the ones who adolescents and adults are mostly concerned about. This is about organization, completing work, performance, and things like it. Um, there is a need to treatment is extended for longer periods of time, meaning you know, if you have a job that you go to every day, and your medication makes a huge difference, you probably should be on the medication for as long as you have a job. Um, all major medications are approved, so the four classes that I mentioned. Um, they're not, the doses are not the same, and I'll go over those in, in uh, some detail, but adults usually recommend the doses are lower. This is counterintuitive. However, please remember, children are more likely, their metabolic rate is higher, and they might be uh, you know, kind of clearing the medication plan. Uh, one really important thing for children, it's like usually cover the school hours and the after 
after school hours. For adults, it's much more challenging depending on what kind of jobs people do. Some people work late hours, some people work at night. So um, coverage throughout the day is important. And the safety considerations, uh, you know, there are a number of side effects, but for children um, with very kind of accidental reports, like really single digits, um, we have not major concerns. However, cardiac events and other comorbid conditions in adults are really to be monitored closely. So in terms of the dose saturation and efficacy, um, stimulants are dosed by kilogram. So metafenidate is one milligram per kilogram daily. Um, you don't always want to go with somebody who is like 100 kilograms and give them 100 milligrams of uh, stimulant. So that's one of the challenge. Amphetamines is like twice as potent, so the dose is uh, lower, 0.5. You can titrate as fast as every couple of days, maybe every week. You don't have to wait as long as the person you know, reports no side effects and is tolerating the medication. Well, remember that the stimulants clear out in the matter of hours, so it's not like the medication is in the system all day long. It's usually for a few hours, and then you can have a quick assessment as if the side effects are there. Um, the current trend is to use extended duration medication. It used to be the time when Ritalin and Dexedrine that are dosed like two or three times a day. Clonidin is uh, dosed like four times a day, immediate release. So multiple administration, that presents with many challenges. Nowadays, uh, if you go back on your own time and look at the table of the different medications, there are many, many extended release uh, medication. So different formulations have come along in terms of the delivery systems, not in terms of new compounds. And um, they extend to 10, 12, 16 hours. There are different uh, ways that that has been uh, achieved. And um, there is one of the challenges is to really, if you need to combine extended release with immediate release formulations, that sometimes is necessary because the portion of the medication that comes as immediate release in the morning and then in the afternoon varies among different formulations. They could be as low as 20% immediate and almost 80% extended release to 50-50. So uh, sometimes some individuals say they need more medication in the morning or if the medication clears fast, they may need additional medication late in the afternoon. This is what immediate release metaphenidate or uh, amphetamine would look like on the PK graph. So there's a peak, a valley, another peak. Around here, people may complain that they feel tired. They may have, feel like a little bit of withdrawal in their second peak. And the new formulations, the long acting, are trying to avoid that and achieve something similar to that, which is more gradual, but you know, relatively quick increase, a peak, about six hours later and much more gradual withdrawal uh, from the medication. How is that achieved? There are different formulations. So these are the combined beads type of uh, formulations as immediate release beads that kind of dissolve quickly and release certain amount of the medication pretty much within the 15 to 30 minutes after administration. So stimulants are very quickly absorbed and quickly um, uptaken in the brain. So it, it, it takes a matter of minutes. And the delayed release beats come in line about four hours later. This is the Oros or Concerta formulation, probably one of the very clever uh, drug delivery systems that we have on the market, period. Um, it has two compartments of the medication and semi-porous membrane here that allows water from the gut to start coming into the capsule and start pushing the medication. So the first chamber releases the medication within the first three hours, and then the second chamber starts releasing the medication after that. So um, this kind of a smoother curve that I showed has been very well documented in the Oros Concerta. And Concerta is the only medication that uses that delivery system. And this is uh, Journey, which is the latest formulation. So for those of you who may not be familiar, but there's a formulation now that you can give to an individual with ADHD to take 
around 9 o'clock at night, and the medication is released about 6 a.m., nine hours later. That's achieved by this two layer of um, release. Uh, the first one, it protects the medication from losing overnight. By that time, the medication travels all the way down to the, you know, the end of the uh, small intestine and uh, the colon. And the second layer, uh, kind of, that shows this extended release late in the day, up to uh, 10 to 12 hours. Now, the one medication that stands out is lixdesamphetamine. This is a prodrug, and what it means by that, uh, when the person takes the medication, this is the formula. Uh, there is a cleavage here that makes the active, that releases the active compound that happens in the blood, not in the gut. So individuals who take this dexamphetamine vivans would not have the immediate kind of effect of it, but it's more of a gradual release. And I'm just going to quickly um, speak here about a study that we did. And the reason I'm mentioning this is one, because we did the study, but the second is, this is the only study that actually looks into clinical improvement with a stimulant in adults and measures that with um, neuroimaging markers. Uh, just to kind of preface that it's saying there are many, many publications that talk about the effect of stimulants on the brain with a challenge, which means the person comes, get the medication, get scanned, hear what we learn, the brain does this and that, whatever, and then that's a challenge study. That cannot tell you anything about the treatment of ADHD. That can tell you about how the brain may change with one dose of the medication. This is different. So we have about 20 adults, uh, as you can see in the mid-30s. The dose is uh, pretty significant, you know, 65, 64 is the mean, and it's a combined and inattentive sample uh, males, females, and ethnically diverse. And this is how the study works. Everybody had a scan after they had a placebo for about three weeks, either in the beginning or at the end, and they had a second scan when they were treated with Lix, uh, Lix desinfetamine for three weeks and then maintained on the most efficacious dose for two weeks. So this is a clinical single blind trial to assess the effect of medication with superimposed uh, neurobiological component on top of it. What you see here is what you want to see. Baseline, before any treatment, these are the ADHD scores. Placebo offers you no much relief. This is not significant, a couple of points. And the treatment uh, shows significant reduction of symptoms compared to the baseline before any treatment and compared to placebo. So clearly, the medication offers improvement of the symptoms collected by the scale. Now, what we, didn't, what we did after that, we correlated that with the changes in the brain. And what we found is that the percent change, the number of improvement, the, the magnitude of improvement, if we all, positively correlated with the changes in the activation, meaning if you do better on symptoms, you show higher activation after treatment in these different areas. And you might be wondering what these different areas are and what they do. Uh, I wouldn't talk about the task, but let's say the task is like a gambling task. You have to decide to press the button, not press the button, expecting to win either a dollar or five dollars, and then you're given the outcome. And the networks that were identified are related to integration of action and reward, or the middle and the frontal parietal gyri that are part of the uh, anterior and posterior attentional networks that are responsible for or related rather to attention orientation, sustained attention, and monitoring of salient stimuli. So all these brain networks that have been linked to particular functions that have to do with the decision to act, anticipation of what your action can bring us, monitor reward, and monitoring of your behavior, when the activation in these networks increase, the symptoms got better. This is the only study that is out there showing this brain behavior relationship with successful treatment. So uh, the quick uh, 
summary is that support our results for the hypothesis that stimulant treatment of ADHD, again, it's treatment, not challenge, can restore balance to dysfunction, hyperactivation within brain networks that related in those functions. Let's talk a little bit about the stimulant side effects. Um, these are the common ones which come with pretty much any medication, but decreased appetite is specific for stimulants. Headaches, this is rather common. <coughs> Sorry. GI uh, problems are one thing that uh, many people report. The way around it is ask somebody to have breakfast and take the medication afterwards. As I mentioned, it's a quick absorption and quick brain uptake. Insomnia, um, also kind of a you know common side effect and the rebound. In the afternoon, if the medication leaves the system too fast, people may have mild withdrawal symptoms and feel like you know, fatigue or frustration or irritability and things like it. There's some rare side effects. So this one probably deserves some mentioning. Sudden cardiac death that came in late 2000s from a report from Canada when in a large group of individuals receiving stimulants, there were 20 sudden deaths. And at the time, actually, we called all the patients that we had on Adderall in particular to inform them about that and ask them if they wanted to stop their treatment. And for most part, people say, well, thank you for calling us and for the information. Please send me my next prescription. Nobody quit their treatment. Southern cardiac death is hard to manage and it's very hard to say if it was even related to medication, but stimulants do have effect on the cardiovascular system. And for adults, that's a particular concern because people develop more cardiac problems as they age, obviously. Uh, so palpitations, especially if somebody has family history, extra systole, anything like that, uh, you should closely monitor. Now, if you have concerns either in terms of side effects, or in terms of substance use potential and things like it, uh, there are many good rationales to use a non-stimulant medication. Some people just cannot tolerate stimulants, or some people don't respond well. Uh, some optimal response is not uncommon. I mean, People feel like they have improved, but they're not up to their full potential. And of course, uh, there are some relative contraindications. I mentioned substance abuse, certainly anxiety could be made worse. Um, some people just don't believe they want to take stimulants. And um, th there are also logistics of prescribing the drug that you have to issue a prescription every month. It's controlled. Uh, some people don't want to go through the trouble of doing that. So atomoxetin can uh, on the market about um, now 20 years ago. And that's one of the first publications showing that the initial studies uh, kind of clearly demonstrated effects, separation from placebo at week two, and this is close to like three months, and this improvement has been sustained throughout the trial. One interesting aspect of atomoxetin is this kind of a B bimodal response, meaning some people this is about close to 50%, maybe the percentage might be lower, have kind of an excellent response, which is more than 40% reduction of symptoms. Good percentage of people have minimal to no response. And there is another 15% that have an intermediate response. So when atomoxetine came, many people clearly said, no, it's not as effective as a stimulant. You know, it has other ways that you have to take it every day. It's a build-up effect. You need to take it for about three to four weeks, maybe. However, whoever responds to stimulant, and that's not untrue for many other psychiatric medications, they respond really well. In terms of dosing, it's also dose per kilogram. The recommended dose is 1.4. There's plenty of good safety data for 1.8 milligrams per kilo. Um, however, there's a lot of evidence for incremental improvement with higher doses, but some have gone to three milligrams for you know large adults. Um, one rare side effect um, is um, I have it here, uh, but uh, in certain individuals who have an, an enzymatic uh, kind of malformation, they can develop jaundice. There are like a few, I don't think a hundred, it's less than a hundred cases. And the um, action is to stop the medication and uh, that disappears. 
uh, poor metabolizers can certainly need lower dose of the medication. Oh, I had it on that slide. So this is the rare uh, hepatic hepatitis. Um, it doesn't require any specific. I mean, you can certainly send for blood tests like bilirubin and things like it, but you have to monitor for, uh, you know, the signs of jaundice and uh, if any of that is there, just discontinue the medication. And these are more trivial side effects. For adult males, urinary retention and sexual dysfunction, I should say that agamoxin was initially also considered for uneuresis because it has uh, the sympathetic effect. And for some uh, adults, that might be rather bothersome. And the fourth big class of medication is the alpha agonist, who we all know are like in the hypertensive medication. So their dosing is an absolute dose, one to four milligrams for guanfacin and 0.1 to 0.4 milligrams for uh, clonidin. Uh, one concern is abrupt discontinuation can uh, be associated with a hypertensive uh, crisis or increased, significant increase of uh, blood pressure. And the titration is usually a weekly escalation. Uh, probably guanfacin XR nowadays is the preferred intonif, which is once a day. You can give it in the morning, you can give it at night. And if you build up, just advise your patients not to abruptly discontinue the medication. The effect size is compatible with atomoxetin, but for both atomoxetin and stimulants, the effect size is lower. Uh, I mean, atomoxetin and alpha agonists, the effect size is lower than stimulants. Uh, again, there are some a very common side effect. A common side effect is actually sedation. Uh, some people do suggest that alpha agonists don't necessarily treat ADHD per se, but they just sedate the person. So kids are kind of more sedated, feeling more tired. Their blood pressure is lower, so they're not as active. There are good animal studies uh, from uh, Amy Ernstein and Yale that show that alpha agonists would have this uh, mechanistic effect on working memory. So They've been shown to be uh, helpful for improving cognitive function and impulsivity, and it's probably not just the sedation. The sedation is a side effect, not necessarily a benefit. Cardiac side effects are more prominent adult than in children, but they are more prominent in children than we initially thought they would be. So monitoring of the blood pressure is important and uh, looking for tachycardia and uh, other events. So the cardiovascular events uh, are most concerning. Uh, EKG, uh, I should say that American Pediatric, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics has cleared stimulants and non-stimulants from baseline EKG if you want to study these medications in children, except for family history. In adults, I think you have to have a good personal history and be you know, kind of mindful of what is the person's uh, cardiac condition. So let me move to the summary and the conclusions of the talk. So ADHD is a complex multifaceted neurodevelopmental disorder. It has strong biological basis. We don't talk much about that, but I think people by now should be convinced. It begins in childhood. It persists over the lifespan. I mentioned initially that we thought maybe 25%. Now we're thinking probably 75% of individuals do have uh, persistent symptoms on some level. In some people, very much so. In some people, maybe borderline clinical. It does remit. There's no question about that. Uh, maybe 25-30% outgrow the disorder. So these are the biological differences, we think. High degree of impairment and societal cost. The effective treatments that impact multiple brain regions. I spoke a little bit about that. But again, there is a sizable literature that shows changes with the administration of medications, and these are networks related to attention, orientation, motivation, all these essential factors that represent the cost symptoms of the disorder. There are numerous medication options that show very good response, just to summarize, but the effect size for stimulants sometimes goes above one, which is a huge effect size. And non-stimulants like atomoxin and guanfacin are usually the 0.5, 0.7 range, which is a very good response. Stimulants generally more effective than non-stimulants if you judge by the effect size. 
non-stimulants have a major role in the treatment of ADHD and comorbidity. Anxiety, uh, atomoxetine was initially developed as an antidepressant, and also comorbid substance use disorder. However, you have to have the treatment for the substance use disorder added to uh, if you're treating somebody for ADHD. Symptoms often persist over time despite treatment. If you stop treatment, the symptoms often come back. Uh, there is no length of treatment that would cure the symptoms. But just keep in mind, symptoms like anything else fluctuate. Combined treatment can offer benefits in selected cases combined between non-stimulant and stimulant or immediate release and extended release stimulant. Uh, and you always have to consider some form of psychosocial treatment because um, for most cases, actually, patients would prefer to start with that. And I would finish with that. I want to thank you all for tuning in. I hope most of the people stay for the presentation. Um, I want to acknowledge that um, my mentor and colleague, Jeff Newcorn, who is a kind of a world authority on ADHD, uh, has uh, helped me over the years and has provided some of the slides for that presentation as well. Uh, and I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you one more time. Thank you, thank Dr. You, Dr. Dr. So I wanted to thank everybody for attending the talk. Uh, I'm going to take uh, some questions now. Let's start uh, with a question that was asked several times. Um, and it's about anxiety and ADHD, about how do you differentiate between the two, but also how do you treat patients who have anxiety and ADHD? Oh, sorry, he's muted there. There it is. Oh, technology. OK, uh, so excellent question because anxiety is probably the most um, prevalent comorbidity uh, for many different reasons. And it's very hard to say this is anxiety is also kind of history of trauma, especially in children, because many presentations in children can come as attentional deficits. And then you, you're thinking if the person has anxiety or trauma related anxiety and that makes their attention kind of fluctuate or they have a core ADHD. How we differentiate? So um, chronology in terms of getting the history, adults are clearly more uh, reliable on that account. It's not that you always be able to tell, oh, this is the one that started first. Now you can think of it, ADHD and associated difficulties in social functioning would probably make anybody anxious. You know, if you're underperforming, you're kind of subject to frequent criticism because your work is not up to par and things like it. Would you get anxious? Yeah, sure, of course. So uh, the question is, do we correct the ADHD and then the anxiety magically goes away? Uh, if you have a clear evidence that's the case, sure. Uh, sometimes it becomes more kind of a comorbid entrenched condition. Stimulants, as I mentioned, can increase the anxiety. However, if the anxiety is linked to this kind of other performances, some people would tell you that they actually are feeling better. So there is a study up in the 90s that looked into self-esteem and anxiety in girls on attentive ADHD, followed them for two years after they were successfully treated with stimulants and showed that their self-esteem and anxiety went down. Now, if you really feel you have to have a second medication, uh, or you have to have a medication for anxiety, what can you do? Um, so atomoxetine has shown efficacy for both mood and anxiety symptoms. So my first choice would be to suggest to somebody, how about we try atomoxetine? Um, there are many studies who have shown that adequate treatment of the ADHD symptoms would improve that, uh, you know, the feeling of frustration and anxiety by itself, but Atomoxetine might be a better choice. Your other option would be to just add a medication. Now you have the part, you have at least the option of non-formulary off-label meds who can treat both ADHD and anxiety, like the SNRIs, the uh, 
uh, Cymbalta might be one of those. Um, Veloxazine would probably get an approval for ADHD coming up soon. So certain antidepressants that have both SNRI and um, dopaminergic effect or neurogenergic effect rather, they could be used to tackle both ADHD and anxiety. So the option is either push the stimulant and you hope that anxiety related to ADHD symptoms would subside, switch to a non-stimulant that can treat mainly ADHD but maybe help with anxiety as well, combine stimulant with any anti-anxiety medication, or you can treat ADHD off-label with something like Effexor or Symbolta. Perfect. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, next question. Uh, someone asked about um, their clinical experience of treating women who have been successful into their 40s, 50s, and 60s, but were having problems with attention and focus and even depression, who had undiagnosed, in their opinion, ADHD and were treated with stimulants and proved significantly. So their question is about, is there a gender difference? And if there is, what accounts for it between men and women um, with adult ADHD? Um, so I should mention that initially probably in the prevalence, but there is a sex difference between the prevalence in uh, males, females. ADHD is more prevalent in males and the ratios are somewhere between 2 to 1, 4 to 1. Uh, and females have more prevalent inattentive subtype of ADHD. So these are kind of the uh, sex differences that at least we know of. Now we are learning more in terms of the effect of the hormonal changes across the lifespan, because as we know, as the hormonal changes fluctuate and diminish uh, later in life, they have significant effect on cognitive function, alertness, attention, sustained attention, and things like it. Um, it is true that uh, it's possible that girls are underdiagnosed because you know the squeaky wheel gets the grease, as they say. Boys might be the ones that the behaviors kind of come on the surface and they're more visible, more observable, and teachers kind of focus on that. Parents notice, they get them to treatment. An inattentive individual, and as I said, it might be more prevalent in girls and women, are the ones that are quiet, they're sitting in class, they're not causing any trouble, they're not doing their work maybe, but that may get unnoticed for a long period of time. That was one of the reasons that actually the age of onset was moved to 12. Uh, the consensus in the field was that many people are undiagnosed in this, especially when they start school between six, the ages of six and 12, but they're undiagnosed because they don't exhibit the behavioral symptoms. And by the age of 12, when the schoolwork increases and now you kind of start realizing, oh, this person is not doing as well as they should be doing, you're out of the criteria, age criteria, and it's like, well, it's not ADHD anymore because they are not six, so, you know, that they're older. Uh, I, I had, in terms of treating adults, I had um, women in their 50s, 60s, and 70s who maintained a very low dose of stimulants as, um, and I should say, I think people who, I mean, there's this effect, individuals with ADHD would have, in general, low IQ points on, on tests, maybe for the reason of like underperforming on the task, on the test, but otherwise there's a whole variety. Individuals with high IQ may have ADHD and they have many ways to compensate. And I think people who are, you know, professionally successful, whatever it might be, a small dose of medication certainly can get them through through life in a very successful way. A couple of patients that I know of. Again, I think the hormonal changes is one aspect of it that we we'll start learning in terms of pregnancy, but in terms of also late in life effects on cognition. I don't think we know enough at that point. Wonderful. Uh, here's a question about um, how to deal with appetite loss and poor weight gain in children on stimulants. And this is very interesting because Dr. Ivanov, I, you know, we, I was there when you were there as a trainee, and I, I remember consulting with you on cases and with Dr. Newcorn as well, who was one of my supervisors. And we've had situations like this, you know, young people, 
you want to you want to treat their ADHD, but you have to be really careful about you know weight loss and poor appetite. So how would you? Yeah. Uh, sure. Let me address that. So uh, adults actually like that effect, right? Uh, <laughs> most adults yeah. take stimulants because that may help. Now, um, it's not the most effective way to control your weight. In terms of the you know treating children, so there there are a couple of things that people need to do and. Um, I probably should mention that, but we didn't speak about children. Uh, so what you need to do is um, monitor weight and height regularly and place the child on the curve. Um, it's a well-known side effect of suppressed appetite and kind of not gaining enough weight. The way around it is make sure that they have their vitamin supplement, make sure that they have a really hard breakfast. And we have this talk over and over again. It's not like, you know, cup of juice and the child should have, you know, they're usually hungry in the morning anyway. And take the medication after that. That kind of takes care of a couple of things. Enough calories in the morning and then usually prevents all these GI side effects. Then we usually instruct parents to offer the child small snacks, uh, you know, uh, for the duration of the day, like two hours later, maybe apple or like a power bar, whatever they like, something else. And then by the time dinner comes, which could be anywhere between five, seven o'clock, most children might be feeling hungry at that point and they would have dinner. So solid breakfast, snacks throughout the day, vitamins, and have a decent sized dinner. For most part, that would do the trick. Nevertheless, if somebody is not gaining as they expected, uh, you probably should uh, then reevaluate. Do you want to consider moving to a non stimulant? In rare cases, we have offered something like pediatrician and things like it. Most pediatricians, so, you know, they're split on that because pediatrician has certain uh, protein load on the kidneys. And if kids are doing three or four of those a day, that's really not a very good strategy. One other thing I want to mention with stimulants, which people talk about a lot, and there is some misconception about that, not eating doesn't necessarily is the reason for kids not growing um, in terms of their height. So there, there is an additional component of stimulants that suppress the dopamine release. That's more of the mechanism. People used to say, well, if they are not eating enough, they're not growing enough, but that's not really the case. There is significant amount of data suggesting that stimulant treatment in childhood is associated with some level of retardation in terms of growth. The good news is that kids with ADHD that are treated with stimulants usually end up height wise in the same range as other kids. But for some kids that might be significant. So if either the appetite suppression is uh, notable or if you're monitoring a child who might be eating OK, but not growing fine and you know, if they're kind of falling behind on the growth curve that every pediatrician has in their office and you can get it on the Internet you probably should stop the stimulant at that point. Good. Uh, there's a question about the uh, the relationship between uh, tobacco cessation and difficulties have people have with quitting smoking and ADHD and if there's anything you, you found in terms of relationship. Um, I had the slides some in some other presentation just because there are too many slides I couldn't include everything. So there is a good Scott Collins is the person who did a meta-analysis, I think it's over 20 studies, showing that individuals with ADHD in general have harder time quitting, uh, maybe using more, but they had more unsuccessful attempts. They tried and go back. And that treatment of stimulants is helpful on that account. Um, so uh, th as I said, there is something about nicotine and not just ADHD, but nicot well, first of all, we know that nicotine has a strong impact on things like attention and many cognitive functions, right? There hasn't been a medication that specifically targets the cholinergic system. That's been kind of the elusive white whale in neurobiological research of ADHD. Um, there is the relationship between exposure during pregnancy and then increased rates of ADHD later on. So there is something within that system that makes it particularly challenging for individuals with uh, nicotine dependence. We also should remember that nicotine is one of the widely used experimented substances during adolescence. 
So children with ADHD might be more prone to develop dependence towards that. First part is education. Um, that has shown to be efficacious. I don't want to go into detail, but when we compare countries that have more strict laws about advertising to children, eliminating like Mr. Cameron, you know, like the child friendly animation and things like it versus countries who don't have any of those restrictions, the rates of use in young individuals are significantly higher. What has made it very challenging is the electronic cigarettes introduction. We have seen a big uptake in use of uh, electronic products in adolescents who are getting addicted to the nicotine because now it's safer kind of thing. Um, so treating adolescent substance use is a major issue. It, it's one of the areas that I work, but it may require just a much larger discussion. It's not just for ADHD. I think we have time for one more question. Sure. Um, and then we'll wrap it up. And I want to thank you again, Dr. Hyvenov, for, for doing this. I, I haven't seen you in a while since I saw you play guitar with the shrinks. The <laughs> uh, shrinks, you're very, yes. Yeah, you're all very talented. And I, maybe when COVID's over, you guys can play again soon. Uh, Hopefully soon, yes. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, so uh, the, the last question is, um, the, the person who asked the question said that they're a parent of a 24-year-old and they've, they've been dealing with this for many years with you know treating their, their son's ADHD, um, but they're curious. They, they haven't heard much about medications on the pipeline and, and they want to know if there's anything new that's going to be coming out, any novel pathways or new treatments. Um, so as I mentioned, we, I mean, on some level we are lucky because there are four different classes uh, and they're chemically different even within the stimulants, although stimulants are rather similar, but still uh, they're not the same chemical, so that makes a difference. Uh, so we have different compounds that actually have different mechanisms of action that allows for combining those medications, switching from one to the next. So there are many different kind of a, the art of you know medicating individuals with ADHD. That's always something that comes up as what is new. I can tell you that over the years we've been involved in several projects of things that look very exciting, but stimulants are a rather high bar to overcome. If you remember this slide that I showed of like the, late, the, the rate of response, the downside is they don't cure the, the disorder, right? It's like you stop the stimulant and symptoms come back. But when people have the efficacy, when they feel the difference, uh, kind of it, it's it's hard to compare um hard to measure up rather now uh veloxazine is uh an snri antidepressant that is currently in fda approval pipeline and some people that i talked to uh, including jet newcorn actually um, they anticipate that it's going to be out with you know an approval uh from the fda by the end of the year to be probably the first of the antidepressant Vortioxetine was studied, which is the um, new antidepressant on the block. Uh, I don't think it got much far. Then most of the developments, so the things that came from this last year would be the veloxazine and then the night at night administration, the journey that is nothing else but methanidate with a different delivery system. There is a interesting story around the company that manufactured that that deserves probably its own time. Uh, however, they almost went bankrupt and then they kind of pretty much get resurrected. Um, the delivery system is ingenious, but it's the same old methanidate and amphetamine. So I don't think there is a radically new compound that is somewhere within the reach, but mostly different delivery systems in terms of having the curve of effect extend beyond the three, four, five hours and managing the side effects in terms of insomnia and things like it. So these are two new things in 2020 and probably the trend would be to different formulations as delivery systems, but not a breakthrough in terms of. Uh, I should say um, there is a paper in uh, Psychiatry Lancet from January, Scott Collins, same name. Uh, there is an approval for a video game, Oculus, what it's called, 
for kind of behavioral intervention. So it's a kind of a training game and it has shown efficacy. So in terms of using, you know, electronics and new technology, that's that's the newest thing that is out there on the market. Wonderful. Uh, well, thank you so much, Dr. Ivanov, for, for this really wonderful all. talk. It was, it was very, very helpful. If, if you want to publish, um, you go to the publish section and fill out the, the questionnaire. And again, thank you so much. And it was really stimulating and very exciting talk. I'm glad. That, I hope people enjoyed it. And thanks again for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye.